Book 9. A visit of emissaries so Trojans kept their watch that night. To seaward panic that attends blood-chilling rout now ruled the Achaeans. All their finest men were shaken by this fear, in bitter throes, as when a shifting gale blows up over the cold fish-breeding sea, north wind and west wind wailing out of Thrace in squall on squall, and dark waves crest, and shoreward masses of weed are cast up by the surf, so were Achaean hearts torn in their breasts. By that great gloom hard hit, the son of Atreus made his way amid his criers and told them to bid each man in person to assembly but not to raise a general cry. He led them, making the rounds himself, and soon the soldiers grimly took their places. Then he rose, with slow tears trickling, as from a hidden spring dark water runs down, staining a rock wall, and groaning heavily he addressed the Argives, friends, leaders of Argives, all my captains, Zeus Cronides entangled me in folly to my undoing. Wayward God, he promised solemnly that I should not sail away before I stormed the inner town of Troy. Crookedness and duplicity, I see now. He calls me to return to Argos beaten after these many losses. That must be his will and his good pleasure, who knows why. Many a great town's height has he destroyed and will destroy, being supreme in power. Enough. Now let us act on what I say, board ship for our own fatherland. Retreat. We cannot hope any longer to take Troy. At this a stillness overcame them all, the Achaean soldiers. Long they sat in silence, hearing their own hearts beat. Then Diams rose at last to speak. He said, My lord, I must contend with you for letting go, for losing balance. I may do so here in assembly lawfully. Spare me your anger. Before this you have held me up to scorn for lack of fighting spirit, old and young, everyone knows the truth of that. In your case, the son of crooked-minded Kronos gave you one gift and not both, a staff of kingship honored by all men, but no staying power, the greatest gift of all. What has come over you, to make you think the Achaeans weak and craven as you say? If you are in a passion to sail home, sail on, the way is clear, the many ships that made the voyage from Mycene with you stand near the sea's edge. Others here will stay until we plunder Troy. Or if they, too, would like to, let them sail for their own country. Sthenelos and I will fight alone until we see the destined end of Ilion. We came here under God. When Diams finished, a cry went up from all Achaeans in wonder at his words. Then Nestor stood and spoke among them, son of Tydeus, formidable above the rest in war, in council, too, you have more weight than others of your age. No one will cry down what you say, no true Achaean will, or contradict you. Still, you did not push on to the end. I know you are young, in years you might well be my last horned son, and yet for all of that you kept your head and said what needed saying before the Argive captains. My own part, as I am older, is to drive it home. No one will show contempt for what I say, surely not Agamemnon, our commander. Alien to clan and custom and hearth fire is he who longs for war, heartbreaking war, with his own people. Let us yield to darkness and make our evening meal. But let the sentries take their rest on watch outside the rampart near the moat, those are my orders for them. Afterward, you direct us, Agamemnon, by right of royal power. Provide a feast for older men, your counsellors. That is duty and no difficulty, your huts are full of wine brought over daily in our ships from Thrace across the wide sea, and all provender for guests is yours, as you are high commander. Your counsellors being met, pay heed to him who counsels best. The army of Achaia bitterly needs a well-found plan of action. The enemy is upon us, near the ships, burning his thousand fires. What Achaian could be high-hearted in that glare? This night will see the army saved or brought to ruin. They heeded him and did his will. Well-armed, the sentries left to take their posts, one company formed around Thrasymedes, Nestor's son, another mustered by Ascalaphos and Elminos, others commanded by Meriones, Aphareus, Dapiros, and Crayon's son, the princely Lycomedes. Seven lieutenants, each with a hundred men, carrying long spears, issued from the camp for outposts chosen between ditch and rampart. Campfires were kindled, and they took their meal. The son of Atreus led the elder men together to his hut, where he served dinner, and each man's hand went out upon the meal. When they had driven hunger and thirst away, old Nestor opened their deliberations, Nestor, whose counsel had seemed best before, point by point weaving his argument, Lord Marshal of the army, Agamemnon, as I shall end with you, so I begin, since you hold power over a great army and are responsible for it, the Lord Zeus put in your keeping staff and precedent that you might gather counsel for your men. 
You should be first in discourse, but attentive to what another may propose, to act on it if he speak out for the good of all. Whatever he may initiate, action is yours. On this rule, let me speak as I think best. A better view than mine no man can have, the same view that I have held these many days since that occasion when, my lord, for all Achilles' rage, you took the girl Briseis out of his lodge, but not with our consent. Far from it, I for one had begged you not to. Just the same, you gave way to your pride, and you dishonored a great prince, a hero to whom the gods themselves do honor. Taking his prize, you kept her and still do. But even so, and even now, we may contrive some way of making peace with him by friendly gifts, and by affectionate words. Then Agamemnon, the Lord Marshal, answered, Sir, there is nothing false in your account of my blind errors. I committed them, I will not now deny it. Troops of soldiers are worth no more than one man cherished by Zeus as he has cherished this man and avenged him, overpowering the army of Achaeans. I lost my head, I yielded to black anger, but now I would retract it and appease him with all munificence. Here before everyone I may enumerate the gifts I'll give. Seven new tripods and ten bars of gold, then twenty shining cauldrons, and twelve horses, thoroughbreds, who by their wind and legs have won me prizes, any man who owned what these have brought me could not lack resources, could not be pinched for precious gold, so many prizes have these horses carried home. Then I shall give him seven women, deft in household handicraft, women of Lesbos I chose when he himself took Lesbos town, as they outshone all womankind in beauty. These I shall give him, and one more, whom I took away from him then, Brazia's daughter. Concerning her, I add my solemn oath I never went to bed or coupled with her, as custom is with men and women. These will be his at once. If the immortals grant us the plundering of Priam's town, let him come forward when the spoils are shared and load his ship with bars of gold and bronze. Then he may choose among the Trojan women twenty that are most lovely, after Helen. If we return to Argos of Achaia, flowing with good things of the earth, he'll be my own adopted son, dear as Orestes, born long ago and reared in bounteous peace. I have three daughters now at home, Chrysothemes, Laodike, and Iphianassa. He may take whom he will to be his bride and pay no bridal gift, leading her home to Peleus Hall. But I shall add a dowry such as no man has given to his daughter. Seven flourishing strongholds I'll give him, Cardamile and Enope and higher in the wild grassland, Holy for I too, and the deep meadowland of Anthea, Ipea and the vineyard slope of Pedasos, all lying near the sea in the far west of Sandy Pylos. In these lands are men who own great flocks and herds, now as his liegemen, they will pay tithes and sumptuous honour to him, prospering as they carry out his plans. These are the gifts I shall arrange if he desists from anger. Let him be subdued. Lord Death indeed is deaf to appeal, implacable, of all gods therefore he is most abhorrent to mortal men. So let Achilles bow to me, considering that I hold higher rank and claim the precedence of age. To this Lord Nestor of Gerenia replied, Lord Marshal of the army, Agamemnon, this time the gifts you offer Lord Achilles are not to be despised. Come, we'll dispatch our chosen emissaries to his quarters as quickly as possible. Those men whom I may designate, let them perform the mission. Phoenix, dear to Zeus, may lead the way. Let Ias follow him, and Prince Odysseus. The criers, Hodios, and Eurobates, may go as escorts. Bowls for their hands here. Tell them to keep silence, while we pray that Zeus the son of Kronos will be merciful. Nestor's proposal fell on willing ears, and criers came at once to tip out water over their hands, while young men filled the wine bowls and dipped a measure into every cup. They spilled their offerings and drank their fill, then briskly left the hut of Agamemnon. Nestor accompanied them with final words and sage looks, especially for Odysseus, as to the effort they should make to bring the son of Peleus round. Following Phoenix, Ias and Odysseus walked together beside the tumbling clamorous whispering sea, praying hard to the girdler of the islands that they might easily sway their great friend's heart. Amid the ships and huts of the Myrmidons they found him, taking joy in a sweet harp of rich and delicate make, the crossbar set to hold the strings being silver. He had won it when he destroyed the city of Eshan, and plucking it he took his joy, he sang old tales of heroes, while across the room alone and silent sat Patroclos, waiting until Achilles should be done with song. Phoenix had come in unremarked, but when the two new visitors, Odysseus leading, entered and stood before him, then Achilles rose in wonderment, and left his chair, his harp still in his hand. So did Patroclos rise at sight of the two men. Achilles made both welcome with a gesture, saying, Peace. 
my two great friends, I greet your coming. How I have needed it. Even in my anger, of all Achaeans, you are closest to me. And Prince Achilles led them in. He seated them on easy chairs with purple coverlets, and to Patroclos who stood near he said, put out an ampler wine bowl, use more wine for stronger drink, and place a cup for each. Here are my dearest friends beneath my roof. Patroclos did as his companion bade him. Meanwhile the host set down a carving block within the fire's rays, a chine of mutton and a fat chine of goat he placed upon it, as well as savoury pork chine. Automede instead the meat for him, Achilles carved, then sliced it well and forked it on the spits. Meanwhile Patroclos, like a god in firelight, made the hearth blaze up. When the leaping flame had ebbed and died away, he raked the coals and in the glow extended spits of meat, lifting these at times from the firestones to season with pure salt. When all was done and the roast meat apportioned into platters, loaves of bread were passed round by Patroclos in fine baskets. Achilles served the meat. He took his place then opposite Odysseus, back to the other wall, and told Patroclos to make offering to the gods. This he did with meat tossed in the fire, then each man's hand went out upon the meal. When they had put their hunger and thirst away, Aias nodded silently to Phoenix, but Prince Odysseus caught the nod. He filled a cup of wine and lifted it to Achilles, saying, Health, Achilles. We've no lack of generous feasts this evening, in the lodge of Agamemnon first, and now with you, good fare and plentiful each time. It is not feasting that concerns us now, however, but a ruinous defeat. Before our very eyes we see it coming and are afraid. By a blade's turn, our good ships are saved or lost, unless you arm your valour. Trojans and allies are encamped tonight in pride before our ramparts, at our sterns, and through their army burn a thousand fires. These men are sure they cannot now be stopped but will get through to our good ships. Lord Zeus flashes and thunders for them on the right, and Hector in his ecstasy of power is mad for battle, confident in Zeus, deferring to neither men nor gods. Pure frenzy fills him, and he prays for the bright dawn when he will shear our stern post beaks away and fire all our ships, while in the shipways amid that holocaust he carries death among our men, driven out by smoke. All this I gravely fear, I fear the gods will make good his threatenings, and our fate will be to die here, far from the pastureland of Argos. Rouse yourself, if even at this hour you'll pitch in for the Achaeans and deliver them from Trojan havoc. In the years to come this day will be remembered pain for you if you do not. No remedy, no remedy will come to hand, once the great ill is done. While there is time, think how to keep this evil day from the Danans. My dear lad, how rightly in your case your father, Peleus, put it in his farewell, sending you out from Thyre to take ship with Agamemnon. Now as to fighting power, child, he said, if Hera and Athena wish, they'll give it. Control your passion, though, and your proud heart, for gentle courtesy is a better thing. Break off insidious quarrels, and young and old, the Argives will respect you for it more. That was your old father's admonition, you have forgotten. Still, even now, abandon heart-wounding anger. If you will relent, Agamemnon will match this change of heart with gifts. Now listen and let me list for you what just now in his quarters he proposed, seven new tripods, and ten bars of gold, then twenty shining cauldrons, and twelve horses, thoroughbreds, that by their wind and legs have won him prizes, any man who owned what these have brought him would not lack resources, could not be pinched for precious gold, so many prizes have these horses carried home. Then he will give you seven women, deft in household handicraft, women of Lesbos chosen when you yourself took Lesbos town, as they outshone all womankind in beauty. These he will give you, and one more, whom he took away from you then, Briseis' daughter, concerning whom he adds a solemn oath never to have gone to bed or coupled with her, as custom is, my lord, with men and women. These are all yours at once. If the immortals grant us the pillaging of Priam's town, you may come forward when the spoils are shared and load your ship with bars of gold and bronze. Then you may choose among the Trojan women twenty that are most lovely, after Helen. And then, if we reach Argos of Achaia, flowing with good things of the earth, you'll be his own adopted son, dear as Orestes, born long ago and reared in bounteous peace. He has three daughters now at home, Chrysothemes, Laodike, and Iphianassa. You may take whom you will to be your bride and pay no gift when you conduct her home to your ancestral hall. He'll add a dowry such as no man has given to his daughter. Seven flourishing strongholds he'll give to you, Cardamile and Enope and higher in the wild grassland 
holy for I too, and the deep meadowland of Anthea, Ipea, and the vineyard slope of Pedasos, all lying near the sea in the far west of Sandy Pylos. In these lands are men who own great flocks and herds, now as your liegemen, they will pay tithes and sumptuous honour to you, prospering as they carry out your plans. These are the gifts he will arrange if you desist from anger. Even if you abhor the son of Atreus all the more bitterly, with all his gifts, take pity on the rest, all the old army, worn to rags in battle. These will honour you as gods are honoured. And ah, for these, what glory you may win. Think, Hector is your man this time, being crazed with ruinous pride, believing there's no fighter equal to him among those that our ships brought here by sea, he'll put himself in range. Achilles the great runner answered him, son of Laertes and the gods of old, Odysseus, master soldier and mariner, I owe you a straight answer, as to how I see this thing, and how it is to end. No need to sit with me like morning doves making your gentle noise by turns. I hate as I hate hell's own gate that man who hides one thought within him while he speaks another. What I shall say is what I see and think. Give in to Agamemnon? I think not, neither to him nor to the rest. I had small thanks for fighting, fighting without truce against hard enemies here. The portions equal whether a man hangs back or fights his best, the same respect, or lack of it, is given brave man and coward. One whose active dies like the do nothing. What least thing have I to show for it, four harsh days undergone and my life gambled, all these years of war. A bird will give her fledglings every scrap she comes by, and go hungry, foraging. That is the case with me. Many a sleepless night I've spent a field and many a day in bloodshed, hand to hand in battle for the wives of other men. In sea raids I plundered a dozen towns, eleven in expeditions overland through Trojan country, and the treasure taken out of them all, great heaps of handsome things, I carried back each time to Agamemnon. He sat tight on the beachhead, and shared out a little treasure, most of it he kept. He gave prizes of war to his officers, the rest have theirs, not I, from me alone of all Achaeans, he preempted her. He holds my bride, dear to my heart. I, let him sleep with her and enjoy her. Why must Argives fight the Trojans? Why did he raise an army and lead it here? For Helen, was it not? Are the Atreidae of all mortal men the only ones who love their wives? I think not. Every sane decent fellow loves his own and cares for her, as in my heart I loved Briseis, though I won her by the spear. Now, as he took my prize out of my hands, tricked and defrauded me, he need not tempt me, I know him, and he cannot change my mind. Let him take thought, Odysseus, with you and others how the ships may be defended against incendiary attack. By God, he has achieved imposing work without me, a rampart piled up overnight, a ditch running beyond it, broad and deep, with stakes implanted in it. All no use. He cannot hold against the killer's charge. As long as I was in the battle, Hector never cared for a fight far from the walls, his limit was the oak tree by the gate. When I was alone one day he waited there, but barely got away when I went after him. Now it is I who do not care to fight. Tomorrow at dawn when I have made offering to Zeus and all the gods, and hauled my ships for loading in the shallows, if you like and if it interests you, look out and see my ships on Helias waters in the offing, oarsmen in line making the sea foam scud. And if the great earth shaker gives a breeze, the third day out I'll make it home to Thyre. Rich possessions are there I left behind when I was mad enough to come here, now I take home gold and ruddy bronze, and women belted luxuriously, and hoary iron, all that came to me here. As for my prize, he who gave her took her outrageously back. Well, you can tell him all this to his face, and let the other Achaeans burn if he in his thick hide of shamelessness picks out another man to cheat. He would not look me in the eye, dog that he is. I will not share one word of counsel with him, nor will I act with him, he robbed me blind, broke faith with me, he gets no second chance to play me for a fool. Once is enough. To hell with him, Zeus took his brains away. His gifts I abominate, and I would give not one dry shuck for him. I would not change, not if he multiplied his gifts by ten, by twenty times what he has now, and more, no matter where they came from, if he gave what enters through Orchomenos town gate or Thebes of Egypt, where the treasures lie, that city where through each of a hundred gates two hundred men drive out in chariots. Not if his gifts outnumbered the sea sands or all the dust grains in the world could Agamemnon ever appease me, not till he pays me back full measure, pain for pain, dishna for dishna. The daughter of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, I will not take in marriage. 
let her be as beautiful as pale gold Aphrodite, skilled as Athena of the sea grey eyes, I will not have her, at any price. No, let him find someone else, an eligible Achaean, kinglier than I. Now if the gods preserve me and I make it home, my father Peleus will select a bride for me. In Hellas and in Thyre there are many daughters of strong men who defend the towns. I'll take the one I wish to be my wife. There in my manhood I have longed, indeed, to marry someone of congenial mind and take my ease, enjoying the great estate my father had acquired. Now I think no riches can compare with being alive, not even those they say this well-built Ilion stored up in peace before the Achaeans came. Neither could all the archers' shrine contains at Rocky Pytho, in the crypt of stone. A man may come by cattle and sheep in raids, tripods he buys, and tawny-headed horses, but his life's breath cannot be hunted back or be recaptured once it pass his lips. My mother, the tease of the silvery feet, tells me of two possible destinies carrying me toward death, two ways, if on the one hand I remain to fight around Troy town, I lose all hope of home but gain unfading glory, on the other, if I sail back to my own land my glory fails, but a long life lies ahead for me. To all the rest of you I say, sail home, you will not now see Ilion's last hour, for Zeus who views the wide world held his sheltering hand over that city, and her troops have taken heart. Return, then, emissaries, deliver my answer to the Achaean peers, it is the senior officer's privilege, and let them plan some other way, and better, to save their ships and save the Achaean army. This one cannot be put into effect, their scheme this evening, while my anger holds. Phoenix may stay and lodge the night with us, then take ship and sail homeward at my side tomorrow, if he wills. I'll not constrain him. After Achilles finished, all were silent, awed, for he spoke with power. Then the old master charioteer, Lord Phoenix, answered at last, and let his tears come shining, fearing for the Achaean ships, Achilles, if it is true you set your heart on home and will not stir a finger to save the ships from being engulfed by fire, or for this rage that has swept over you, how, child, could I be sundered from you, left behind alone? For your sake the old master charioteer, Peleus, made provision that I should come, that day he gave you Godspeed out of Thyre to go with Agamemnon. Still a boy, you knew nothing of war that levels men to the same testing, nothing of assembly where men become illustrious. That is why he sent me, to instruct you in these matters, to be a man of eloquence and action. After all that, dear child, I should not wish to be left here apart from you, not even if God himself should undertake to smooth my wrinkled age and make me fresh and young, as when for the first time I left the land of lovely women, Hellas. I went north to avoid a feud with father, Aminta Ormonides. His anger against me rose over a fair-haired slave girl whom he fancied, without respect for his own wife, my mother. Mother embraced my knees and begged that I make love to this girl, so that afterward she might be cold to the aging man. I did it. My father guessed the truth at once, and cursed me, praying the ghostly furies that no son of mine should ever rest upon his knees, a curse fulfilled by the immortals, Lord Zeus of Undergloom and cold Persephone. I planned to put a sword in him, and would have, had not some god unstrung my rage, reminding me of country gossip and the frowns of men, I shrank from being called a parasite among the Achaeans. But from that time on I felt no tie with home, no love for lingering under the roof tree of a raging father. Our household and our neighbours, it is true, urged me to stay. They made a handsome feast of shambling cattle butchered, and fat sheep, young porkers by the litter, crisp with fat, were singed and spitted in Hephaestos fire, rivers of wine drunk from the old man's store. Nine times they spent the night and slept beside me, taking the watch by turns, leaving a fire to flicker under the entrance colonnade, and one more in the court outside my room. But when the tenth night came, starless and black, I cracked the tight bolt on my chamber door, pushed out, and scaled the courtyard wall, unseen by household men on watch or women slaves. Then I escaped from that place, made my way through Hellas where the dancing floors are wide, until I came to Thyre's fertile plain, mother of flocks, and Peleus the king. He gave me welcome, treated me with love, as a father would an only son, his heir to rich possessions. And he made me rich, appointing me great numbers of retainers on the frontier of Thyre, where I lived as lord of Delopes. Now, it was I who formed your manhood, handsome as a god's, Achilles, I who loved you from the heart, for never in another's company would you attend a feast or dine in hall, never, unless I took you on my knees and cut your meat, and held your cup of wine. Many a time you wet my shirt, hiccuping wine bubbles in distress, when you were small. Patient and laborious as a nurse I had to be for you, bearing in mind that never would the gods bring into being any son of mine. 
Godlike Achilles, you were the manchild that I made my own to save me someday, so I thought, from misery. Quell your anger, Achilles. You must not be pitiless. The gods themselves relent, and are they not still greater in bravery, in honor, and in strength? Burnt offerings, courteous prayer, libation, smoke of sacrifice, with all of these, men can placate the gods when someone oversteps and errs. The truth is, prayers are daughters of Almighty Zeus, one may imagine them lame, wrinkled things with eyes cast down, that toil to follow after passionate folly. Folly is strong and swift, outrunning all the prayers, and everywhere arriving first to injure mortal men, still they come healing after. If a man reveres the daughters of Zeus when they come near, he is rewarded, and his prayers are heard, but if he spurns them and dismisses them, they make their way to Zeus again and ask that folly dog that man till suffering has taken arrogance out of him. Relent, be courteous to the daughters of Zeus, you too, as courtesy sways others, and the best. If Agamemnon had no gifts for you, name none to follow, but invade against you still in fury, then I could never say, discard your anger and defend the Argives, never, no matter how they craved your help. But this is not so, he will give many things at once, he promised others, he has sent his noblest men to intercede with you, the flower of the army, and your friends, dearest among the Argives. Will you turn their words, their coming, into humiliation? Until this moment, no one took it ill that you should suffer anger, we learned this from the old stories of how towering wrath could overcome great men, but they were still amenable to gifts and to persuasion. Here is an instance I myself remember not from our own time but in ancient days, I'll tell it to you all, for all our friends. The Caretes were fighting a warlike race, Aetolians, around the walls of Caledon, with slaughter on both sides, Aetolians defending their beloved Caledon while the Caretes longed to sack the town. The truth is, Artemis of the Golden Chair had brought the scourge of war on the Aetolians, she had been angered because Oeneus made no harvest offering from his vineyard slope. While other gods enjoyed his hecatombs he made her none, either forgetful of it or careless, a great error, either way. In her anger, the mistress of long arrows roused against him a boar with gleaming tusks out of his wild grass bed, a monstrous thing that ravaged the man's vineyard many times and felled entire orchards, roots, blooms, apples, and all. Now this great boar Meliagros, the son of Oeneus, killed by gathering men and hounds from far and near. So huge the boar was, no small band could master him, and he brought many to the dolorous pyre. Around the dead beast Artemis set on a clash with battle cries between Caretes and proud Aetolians over the boar's head and shaggy hide. As long, then, as Meliagros, backed by the war god, fought, the Caretes had the worst of it for all their numbers and could not hold a line outside the walls. But then a day came when Meliagros was stung by venomous anger that infects the coolest thinker's heart, swollen with rage at his own mother, Altai, he languished in idleness at home beside his lady, Cleopater. This lovely girl was born to Marpes of ravishing pale ankles, Ueno's child, and Ides, who had been most powerful of men on earth. He drew the bow against the Lord Phoebos Apollo over his love, Marpes, whom her father and gentle mother called Alcyone, since for her sake her mother gave that seabird's forlorn cry when Apollo ravished her. With Cleopater lay Meliagros, nursing the bitterness his mother stirred, when in her anguish over a brother slain she cursed her son. She called upon the gods, beating the grassy earth with both her hands as she pitched forward on her knees, with cries to the lord of undergloom and cold Persephone, while tears wetted her veils, in her entreaty that death come to her son. Inexorable in Erebos a vampire fury listened. Soon, then, about the gates of the Aetolians tumult and din of war grew loud, their towers rang with blows. And now the elder men implored Meliagros to leave his room, and sent the high priests of the gods, imploring him to help defend the town. They promised him a large reward, in the green countryside of Caledon, wherever it was richest, there he might choose a beautiful garden plot of fifty acres, half in vineyard, half in virgin prairie for the plough to cut. Oeneus, master of horsemen, came with prayers upon the dorsal of the chamber, often rattling the locked doors, pleading with his son. His sisters, too, and then his gentle mother pleaded with him. Only the more fiercely he turned away. His oldest friends, his dearest, not even they could move him, not until his room was shaken by a hail of stones as Caretes began to scale the walls and fire the city. Then at last his lady in her soft belted gown besought him weeping, speaking of all the ills that come to men whose town is taken, soldiers put to the sword, the city raised by fire, alien hands carrying off the children and the women. Hearing these fearful things, his heart was stirred to action, he put on his shining gear and fought off ruin from the Aetolians. Mercy prevailed in him. 
His folk no longer cared to award him gifts and luxuries, yet even so he saved that terrible day. Oh, do not let your mind go so astray. Let no malignant spirit turn you that way, dear son. It will be worse to fight for ships already set afire. Value the gifts, rejoin the war, Achaeans afterward will give you a god's honor. If you reject the gifts and then, later, enter the deadly fight, you will not be accorded the same honor, even though you turn the tide of war. But the great runner Achilles answered, Old Uncle Phoenix, bless you, that is an honor I can live without. Honored I think I am by Zeus justice, justice that will sustain me by the ships as long as breath is in me and I can stand. Here is another point, ponder it well, best not confuse my heart with lamentation for Agamemnon, whom you must not honor, you would be hateful to me, dear as you are. Loyalty should array you at my side in giving pain to him who gives me pain. Rule with me equally, share half my honor, but do not ask my help for Agamemnon. My answer will be reported by these two. Lodge here in a soft bed, and at first light we can decide whether to sail or stay. He knit his brows and nodded to Patroclos to pile up rugs for Phoenix's bed, a sign for the others to be quick about departing. Aeus, however, noble son of Telamon made the last appeal. He said, Odysseus, master soldier and mariner, let us go. I do not see the end of this affair achieved by this night's visit. Nothing for it but to report our talk for what it's worth to the Danans, who sit waiting there. Achilles hardened his great heart against us, wayward and savage as he is, unmoved by the affections of his friends who made him honored above all others on the beachhead. There is no pity in him. A normal man will take the penalty for a brother slain or a dead son. By paying much, the one who did the deed may stay unharmed at home. Fury and pride in the bereaved are curbed when he accepts the penalty. Not you. Cruel and unappeasable rage the gods put in you for one girl alone. We offer seven beauties, and much more besides. Be gentler, and respect your own roof tree whereunder we are guests who speak for all Danans as a body. Our desire is to be closest to you of them all. Achilles the great runner answered him, Sign of Telamon and gods of old, Aias, lord of fighting men, you seem to echo my own mind in what you said. And yet my heart grows large and hot with fury remembering that affair, as though I were some riffraff or camp follower, he taunted me before them all. Go back, report the news, I will not think of carnage or of war until Prince Hector, son of Priam, reaches Myrmidon huts and ships in his attack, slashing through Argives, burning down their ships. Around my hut, my black ship, I foresee for all his fury, Hector will break off combat. That was his answer. Each of the emissaries took up a double-handed cup and poured libation by the shipways. Then Odysseus led the way on their return. Patroclos commanded his retainers and the maids to make at once a deep-piled bed for Phoenix. Obediently they did so, spreading out fleeces and coverlet and a linen sheet, and down the old man lay, awaiting dawn. Achilles slept in the well-built hut's recess, and with him lay a woman he had brought from Lesbos, Forba's daughter, Diomede. Patroclos went to bed at the other end, and with him, too, a woman lay, soft-belted Iphis, who had been given to him by Achilles when he took Skyros, ringed by Cliff, the mountain fastness of Aeneas. Now the emissaries arrived at Agamemnon's lodge. With cups of gold held up, and rising to their feet on every side, the Achaeans greeted them, curious for the news. Lord Agamemnon put the question first, come, tell me, sir, Odysseus, glory of Achaia, will Achilles fight off ravenous fire from the ships or does he still refuse, does anger still hold sway in his great heart? That patient man, the prince Odysseus, made reply, Excellency, Lord Marshal of the army, son of Atreus, the man has no desire to quench his rage. On the contrary, he is more than ever full of anger, spurns you and your gifts, calls on you to work out your own defense to save the ships and the Achaean army. As for himself, he threatens at daybreak to drag his well-found ships into the surf, and says he would advise the rest as well to sail for home. You shall not see, he says, the last hour that awaits tall Ilion, for Zeus who views the wide world held his sheltering hand over the city, and her troops have taken heart. That was Achilles' answer. Those who were with me can confirm all this, Aias can, and the two clear-headed criers. As to old Phoenix, he is sleeping there by invitation, so that he may sail to his own country, homeward with Achilles, tomorrow, if he wills, without constraint. When he had finished everyone was still, sitting in silence and in perturbation for a long time. 
At last brave Diams, Lord of the Warcry, said, Excellency, Lord Marshal of the Army, Agamemnon, you never should have pled with him, or given so many gifts to him. At the best of times he is a proud man, now you have pushed him far deeper into his vanity and pride. By God, let us have done with him, whether he goes or stays. He'll fight again when the time comes, whenever his blood is up or the God rouses him. As for ourselves, let everyone now do as I advise and go to rest. Your hearts have been refreshed with bread and wine, the pith and nerve of men. When the fair dawn with fingertips of rose makes heaven bright, deploy your men and horses before the ships at once, and cheer them on, and take your place, yourself, in the front line to join the battle. All gave their assent in admiration of Diams, breaker of horses. When they had spilled their wine they all dispersed, each man to his own hut, and lying down they took the gift of sleep. 